Hey, this is Carl. Richard and I, like many of you, are shocked by the attacks taking place in Israel. Our thoughts are with those who have been affected. We recorded this show with Oren back in July. I hope you enjoy it. Psst. How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, Carl and Richard here. As you may have heard, NDC is back, offering their incredible in-person conferences around the world. NDC Porto is happening October 16th through the 20th. Go to ndcporto.com to register. And check out the full lineup of conferences at ndcconferences.com. Hey, guess what? It's not Nan Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin. And I'm Richard Campbell. Oranini is here with us, but we'll introduce him in a minute after I talk to my friend who's moving still his house it's the slow move you know we got two months to do that so they the top floor of the house is now cleared out the basement's almost empty we'll probably have it done by the end of the week we were sorting glassware the other day what do we want to keep when we get rid of i have a lot of whiskey glasses are you surprised no not at all nice hand-blown glasses i got for christmas once upon a time by a friend of mine and uh Although my current favorites are these heavy bottom Norlin glasses. And I'm like, and she's like, well, which of these do you want me to keep like on hand for when we arrive? I'm like, oh, a pair of these Norlins will be just fine. Thanks. I, uh, I remember getting you some hand blown glasses. That's the for ones Christmas. I was referring to. Yeah. And I have one of the two that I had left. Cause yeah. what I do is I make sure and break one. Yeah. So I don't have a matching set anymore. So I have lots of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Lots think you of gave st- me four of those, and they were not all the same because they are hand blown. They are hand blown. But I yeah. think I have two left. Like there yeah. have been casualties too. I got those in Vermont, or was it New yeah. Hampshire? They're Beautiful. they're kind of the same place, Beautiful just glasses. different. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's roll the crazy music because I got something fun for you, my friend. All right. <laughs> All right, dude, what do you got? All right, so I set upon myself to try to write uh, some Bluetooth stuff uh, in Maui, right? Oh, boy. Yeah, because I have, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a masochist. I just <sighs> don't hurt enough. You know, yeah, I'm th- I think of the old software developers credo. We did these things not because we are, they are hard, but because we thought they weren't hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, and we know they're hard. And we may end up tearing our hair out, but that doesn't matter. It's the journey that's fun, right? It's getting up to that point where you're like, all right, I quit. You know, yeah. it's uh, everything up into that point is fun. So uh, I asked my friend Dwayne LaFlotte from security this week, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if he had any hints on hacking Bluetooth, right? Sniffing packets, because right. here's really what I wanted to do. I want, I have, the, I have these little guys right here. This is a Zoom F2BT, and it's it's an encapsulated recorder and lav mic, all right, with a battery and an SD card. And basically, that you there is an app for Bluetooth, right? But the app can only let you connect to one at a time. So, I what I really want to do is tell them all to start recording at the same time. Because if I'm in a podcast situation or on a film or something like that, I just want to press one button and let them all record. Right. So it it requires some hacking. And I know Oren's like, hack, hack, hack. Yes, let's do this. Yes. Uh, but so Dwayne sent me to this website, Hack a Day. And this is Tom Nardi's uh, blog post, a crash course on sniffing Bluetooth low energy. And there are actually three videos that Hmm. this guy pointed to and the first video says all right here's what you got to buy one of these and so this is yeah a little a little uh usb dongle with a with a ble module on it yeah it's but it's more than that it's got this sniffer stuff built into it and it's 10 bucks and you can get it on amazon 
So uh, then I went down. This is I know this is a really long and boring story, but uh, the end result I'm hoping will be a .NET show on using Bluetooth and you know how I hacked the box kind of thing. So, but uh, that I'm working on it now. Yeah, at least nothing else. You know, it's a diagnostic tool, right? Right. You're not trying to steal anything from anybody here, but it's like I, I'm just trying to diagnose what the heck is going on. No, and I'm certainly not going to sell any software that uses any hacked information, right? I mean, I just, I it is diagnostic. I want to see what's going on, and when I press this button on this app and this thing starts recording. And then I just want to, you know, write some software so I can, for my personal use, um, you know, work with this the way that I want to work. So I'll let you know what happens. But that's yeah, good luck. That's what's going on right now. Hey, who's talking to us, Richard? Grabbed a comment off of show sixteen fifty five. That's actually one we did with Jeremy Miller when we were talking a bit about NoSQL. And this is mostly a criticism about talking about NoSQL. It's from Alice Kloss. It's back from twenty nineteen which is more recent than the last time we did a show with Oren, because that was entirely too long ago. Uh, but Alex says, uh, hey, it was always interesting to hear from rock stars like Jeremy Miller, but as this show was constantly sliding towards NoSQL, oh my goodness, uh, some statements from Carl and Richard about NoSQL put me a bit off, like Richard saying, why would you make the customer wait to decompose objects, just store the object? Or Carl saying, it'd also be different if NoSQL databases weren't so damn performant. <laughs> uh, though I understand that adding all the caveats to the statements would make the show boring, but being a DDD worshiper and active NoSQL user and developer for years, here's my outcry. There is a serious cost associated with developing and supporting NoSQL databases. Consider at least okay. document type DBs, which most people imply when they say NoSQL. The aggregates are designed for the most often operation, which is reading data. So mm. persisting aggregates is not meant to be quick. It involves data duplication, maintaining references outside of the aggregates, and so on. And about performance, hey, SQL's performant too. The question is for what task or role you want to optimize for performance. There are niches where NoSQL shines, graph databases for tracing links, document DBs to scale in a geo-distributed database cluster, I do like NoSQL, and I like to see more usage of it, especially in enterprise projects. But the modern, hazy understanding of NoSQL obstructs adoption of the technology. Seeing it in a pragmatic way, just as another tool in your tool belt, even with SQL as the default option, would remove the perception of the untouchable shrine and get more folks using it. Yeah, I don't know if I agree. You know, I think we definitely said, like, you want to add this to your toolkit, and they certainly the two tools work together. You know, my whole... Don't make the customer wait. Just store the object, knowing that perfectly well shortly after that, you'll probably, when they asynchronously decompose the object into rows and columns anyway, is using the two data stores together. Just keeping a copy of the truth in terms of the document, as well as decomposing data for your reporting and so forth. So you don't have to try and do all that crazy reporting against NoSQL. Use the tools for what they're good at. Yeah. So, Alex, thank you so much for your comment. And a copy of Music Code Buy is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music Code Buy, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or on the Facebook. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music Code Buy. And you can follow us on Twitter if you like, or is it called X now? I don't know. I can't keep up with what the kids are calling it. But uh, yeah. but the, the real fun for us is uh, over on Mastodon. Uh, I'm Carl Franklin at techhub.social. And I'm Rich Campbell at mastodon.social. Start following us and toot us whenever you like. Yeah. We like it. I'm also on Blue Sky and on Threads. Yeah. But, you know, the, the there's too many apps these days. It's interesting we'll to see, you know, who's going to go where here. By the next time we record, I'll actually have all my information for Blue Sky and Threads. There you go. Then we'll yeah. just have, yeah, it's like follow all the things. All the I, things. Yeah. They've all, you know, all I can tell you is they just, at this moment, appear less toxic than Twitter, but that's not much of an achievement. <laughs> Okay, so let's bring back our good and very old friend. No, our so very old. good and so old very friend. Old. Very, <laughs> very old. Very, very old. Otherwise known as Ayande Rahini, he has over 20 years experience in the development world with a strong focus on Microsoft and .NET. Uh, an internationally known presenter or has spoken at conferences such as DevTeach, J-A-O-O. What do you call that? Jao? Jao. Jao. Yeah. QCon or Dev, NDC, Yao, and Progressive.net. 
Orin's the author of the book DSLs in Boo, Domain Specific Languages and .NET, published by Manning. His main focus is on architecture and best practices that promote quality software and zero friction development. Oh, yeah. There's also that Raven DB thing and those Rhino mocks <laughs> and all that stuff. You so we have, did that that ORM heard. Smackdown in Montreal in like 2007. Five. Oh, so Five, fun. maybe? Uh, 2007. I'm, I'm looking at show number 240. Really? And wow. then... Uh, and then you started talking to us about RavenDB in 2011. Mm. Yeah, the, f- the funny thing about that, that was I was talking with Ted Newout, and I was on the side of relational databases at the time. Sure. And going back to what Alex said uh, about NoSQL and SQL, the primary difference is not so much the structure of the data, but the use case and the whole package, if I'm comparing a relational database and DDD system, you tend to have to work with dozens of tables in order to compose a single root aggregate. And things like denormalization sounds really bad until you realize that, oh yes, I copy your address into the order. So now I have two copies of your address, which may have the same bits, but not the same meaning. Right. Because the, the address on the order is your address at the time of the order, which is a very subtle but very important distinction from your current address. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, I also and- remember you were using in Hibernate and in an ORM, uh, mm-hmm. Ted was sort of pro store procedures and you're like, yeah, that just gets in the way of an ORM. You want to be doing dynamic SQL because, like you said, yeah. multiple tables, multiple this. So the developer needs the power to create those queries on the fly. One of the key aspects um, then and today is that you want to be able to make modification to your software. You want to be able to evolve and go that. And anything that would barriers in front of that is a huge problem, especially if you have something that adds a lot of ceremony and uh, and fear. And in a lot of cases, oh, um, the database server is down, is something that used to be, wow, the world is falling, and the database server is down. Yeah, I know, I just hooked the uh, debugger to it. I will be, I will release that in a few seconds, or a few minutes, or a few hours, but, you know, I got a couple of replicas that took over automatically, and I don't really have to think about that. Mm. And that's the sort of thing that you want to have, that sort of behavior of, okay, I'm doing things, and the system behaves. Yeah, it's true. And it's uh, and it's becoming more common, I think. I mean, it's crazy to think how long we've been talking about this and all these different models, and you are seeing more folks going down these practices. And they have to. They have yeah. to because the amount of specialization that you get to is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, in 2007, I was a, what would today be called a backend a developer, but I was writing jQuery on a daily basis because, you know, I was doing the, the, the whole thing. I right. wasn't doing the graphic artist, but I was writing the, a, uh, Ajax calls and yeah. using Navigating update panels. Down trees, like, yeah. And, yeah. and then I would go ahead and optimize the indexes on SQL servers and be very careful about how I interact between the application and the database. And today it got to the point where there is a much stronger separation between the different layers. And you have a front end engineer and a back end developers. And they have very distinct skill sets to the point where today I, I like to uh, introduce myself. Hey, I consider a, a UI to be the table tag. This is how right. I do UI. <laughs> and uh, 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 about half your audience right now just cringe very, very yep. hard. Yes. <laughs> and you mentioned old before. Here is a way to make you feel really old. Mm. I interviewed a software developer for a junior position. And one of the things that I like to ask them is, okay, tell me how you would build a phone book 
And the idea What's here. What's a phone book? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. They knew what it was. He thought it was an app. Oh, of course yeah. they thought they it was have an app. <laughs> never in their life seen the physical object. Yeah. Like yeah. it was, you know, middle ages stuff, something like that. Oh, yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's yeah, from, sure. the, from, from forever ago. Yeah. The last time we actually talked about RavenDB on the show as, a, you know, as a key topic, it was for V4 in 2018. So it's been five yeah. years. Anything happening? Oh, dear God. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we are now on the cusp yes. of, uh. yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm trying to think about all of the things that I have that happened there. Yeah, but maybe a couple, I, of, couple of things. Yeah. Uh, so right now we are on the cusp of releasing version 6.0. Great. And that has been something that we've been working on since before uh, Corona, since before COVID. And, uh, which is something that, uh, at 2018, I swore I would never do multi-year projects again. The multi-year. 4.0 release for FNDB was a uh, close to a three-year project. It was extremely ambitious. I was, uh, uh, in hindsight, I was very, very, uh, Bold to do that. I'm, right. I'm saying bold, but I mean stupid. Mm. Uh, well, you were young and full of energy. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> it was actually quite successful. Yes. Uh, managed to bring performance by uh, about uh, 10 times faster and all those sorts of things. Was able to run on Linux as well, uh, build their own uh, storage and a whole bunch of really nice stuff around that. And since then... We actually uh, uh, focus a lot on uh, integration with uh, whatever this is, Kafka or ETL processes, uh, running in massively distributed environments. I have a customer who is running uh, over a million instances of revenue in 36,000 locations. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Yeah, and the... The funny thing about it is that their challenge is not managing all of those instances, but okay, I have a million RevDB nodes and I need to be able to query across all of them. Right. And some of them are, you know, in Malaysia and the internet is not so good. Uh, and you don't want to have a query hit, uh, I mean, databases. So we actually have built processes to do, um, wide data aggregation across all of those instances into a, a S3 bucket or Azure Blob Store or something like that, and then apply a queries on top of that. Uh, we did a lot around a monitoring operations, things like that. Uh, one of the things that we really pay attention to is um, the convenience of operations and what it means to be able to run a server uh, uh, set up a cluster and not really have to think about all of those nitty gritty details. I want to get the, for the developer who don't actually care about, uh, all of, you know, the low level database tasks to be able to create a su- successful project. But that means that I have to assume that the person who is using me is not an expert, doesn't want to be an expert. So, uh, I think that, uh, a lot of the time that I spent recently was about uh, getting, to, to use a car example, moving to the point that you don't have to hear the problem with the car engine at high speed. There is a check engine line that says, hey, there is a problem. Go to the garage. They will fix it. And that's the only thing that you need to do. Awesome. Uh, and and uh, what about the cloud product? Uh, we are in the cloud since 2019 or something like that. Right. And... The basic idea is that, okay, I want to have Raven to be, I want to have even less hassle. So you go, you say, okay, I want to run it on Azure US East or a, a GCP in Australia. You get a cluster and basically from that point on, you just read and write data and you don't care about anything else. Uh, which was a really interesting uh, process because uh, the sort of challenges that we had to face when running the cloud were completely different than the ones that we are used to. And one of the toughest challenges was actually how do you structure your system in such a way that you can bill people accurately? 
And here is a, a, a fun fact. Uh, every cloud uh, a system have a different billing, uh, uh, billing rules and behaviors. And in Azure, if you're using a certain type of disk, you build per something they call storage transaction. And okay, if you have someone that does a lot of fights, that means that the, uh, you have to somehow account for that and direct that to the right customers and then build them for those charges. Mm-hmm. And that was actually a lot more complicated than it sounds because on one hand, you want as, least, as little infrastructure as possible. There, on the other hand, you need to be able to account for each charge on the system. Mm. So I guess that brings us back to the point that you've been busy. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it's uh, also been a while. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. We well, are, yeah. We basically missed version five. We talked about four back in 2018. Mm-hmm. You're about to ship six. Yes. So, yeah. And the big tickets for uh, version six are uh, sharding and corox. And sharding is the ability to run on ridiculously sized data sets. And corox. That's, by the way, S-H-A-R-D, not S-H-A-R-T. Subtle difference. Which is something else entirely. Subtle difference. Okay. I don't even know if I've yes. heard that term before. I uh, Yes. Uh, okay. I, got, I, I got that, but I have to translate in my head. It's, That's, uh, I'm no, sorry. My- <laughs> yeah. So, Lord, I uh, apologize. Lord. <laughs> All right. So, Sharding, tell, tell us how yes. that happens in RavenDB. First of all, what is it? Um, okay. Going back to the old examples. You used to have encyclopedias. To the people who don't know that, that's mm-hmm. Ask your parents. a big book. But <laughs> it's so big that you can't fit it in one book. Yes. You had to split it into multiple volumes. Yes. And the idea here is that by fitting the, the whole data set into multiple volumes, you're able to pick and operate on a single volume mm. and not have to carry, you know, a 200 pounds book from one place to the, uh, to the other. In database terms, sharding is the exact same notion. The ability to split your data into multiple machines, but this, but uh, this is key. This is still the same database. This still give you the ability to ask questions across the entire data set. And the reason this is important is that it's very easy to say, okay, here is a database. This holds all of my users A to N. And this is all of the users uh, uh, P to X and whatever. And, but then in your application code, you have to know, oh, now I'm talking about user, uh, uh, U. So it goes to this server. Now I'm going to user A. It goes to this server, stuff like that. You don't want to have that inside of your application code. Yeah. The application layer should work like any other API. Yeah. Yeah. It should be completely transparent for you. Mm. Now, sharding used to be a mandatory requirement for databases, for big databases. Uh, and the reason was very simple. Go back 20 years, and the best disk you could buy for uh, enterprise drives was a 10K, 15K uh, uh, disk. Mm. And by, uh, by uh, 15,000 revolutions per minute, yeah. And I don't even, you, you don't even want to know how much they cost. They're <laughs> well expensive. Yeah. Um, and, and fragile. Yeah. yeah. And if you wanted to get good performance out of them, you had to use tricks. Um, Richard, you probably remember that, Great, uh, sorry, short stalking. Yep. Uh, when, uh, you have a 128 uh, a gigabyte disk, but you would only use like 60 gigabyte out of that. Because that meant that the needle of the disk would have to traverse less space and that was faster. Uh, okay. Yeah. The platters were physically smaller on these 15K disks. Mm. A, to reduce momentum because they're really spinning fast. And the wider they are, the more stress there was on them. But uh, to shorten the seek times. Mm. Like we, they just before SSDs really took a hold, we were doing crazy stuff with spinning media, just trying to eke out more performance. Now, with all of that, you're still limited by the physical hardware, which meant that on a really good disk, you could do maybe 500 operations per second, mm. thousand operations per second. Sometimes you had these crazy disks that use 
DRAM and battery backup yep. and try to do things like that. But again, we're talking about, start talking about prices of a car mm. for a, a disc and you need a multiple of those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that meant that uh, if you had a large database, you were physically limited by how much data and how much volume of data you could push through that. Mm-hmm. And the answer to that was, okay, let's get more disks. Right. Especially yep. because you could get 10 disks, 20 disks, and the machines to run them on the same cost of one of those really expensive hard drives. Yeah. So now the, the reason for sharding is, isn't physical media, is it? It's, uh, no, uh, and really, uh, uh, and something really interesting happened along the way. Uh, it used to be the case that you had a limit, a hard limit for what sort of machine you could, uh, you could get. And that limit, uh, it wasn't even a limit of what your credit card would hold. It was a limit of what was even available in the market. Mm. And if you wanted the, this to be the case that you would say, okay, um, I want to be able to handle 20 requests per second per server. That was the, uh, uh, off the cuff numbers for the sort of performance you want to expect. And today you can handle a thousand requests per second at a lower latency on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, right. And a lot of that relates to the better hardware, but most of that relates to SSD and NVMe. Mm-hmm. Whereas you could now get, uh, previously you get 500 uh, IOPS per second on a really good drive. Now you can get 500,000 IOPS on a medium level drive. Mm. Right. And that changed uh, a lot of the equation. The cloud also made a really interesting uh, change in the way that pricing works. So if I want to get, a, a, if I have an X machine, with a particular hardware and software. And I have, and it's not sufficient to run my software. I need better, more resources. I now have two options ahead of me. I can get three machines, three X, and run them on three separate servers. And with load balancing and all of the details around that. Or I can just get one machine with three times the resources. And the key aspect here is that both of those options from a financial perspective are identical. And if you think about it, that's really kind of crazy because it means from operational perspective, now I have a far better option ahead of me. Oh, I don't need to go into a cluster or a cluster of shards, all sorts of things. I can just run it on bigger machines. And it is, it used to be the case that, okay, you cannot get a bigger machine, but you can go to Amazon right now or Azure and get a 24 terabyte RAM machine right, yeah. with insane, something huh? like 500 uh, 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 CPUs. So admittedly, that's, uh, not a, that's maybe buy a car a month or buy an apartment <laughs> level of money, buy but building. it is available. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the really funny thing here is that it might make financial sense to go to that route because you may be paying for six developers to manage the uh, other system. Mm-hmm. Right. So because of that, sharding was actually one of the features that Revenue had in 2010. And around the uh, four, four versions, so around 2018, we dropped that feature mm. because... We you could still use it as you previously did that, but it, we could we didn't have the time to complete it to the level of polish that I thought that uh, this feature deserved. So and this has been something that bugged me, mm. <laughs> uh, like for two reasons. First, we had it and we lost it, and I didn't like that. Mm. But it is also one of those features that you need to have for that awful, awful scenario where you're wildly successful. Terrible. Right. Yes. So, well, I wouldn't like, wish that uh, on anyone. I know, because it's so <laughs> complex. Yeah. But the, I mean, the corollary for you as a product owner is like, you don't want to get to a place where your customers have to leave your product because they've been successful. Correct. 
Yeah. And the worst thing from my, from my perspective is that if you're planning to be successful, you're probably not even going to consider this because, oh, I'm go, I, I'm going to need to be a, a scalable and big data and all those sort of things. So I cannot use this, even though by our metrics, we are seeing that 90, 95% of projects never reach anything that would even be close to meeting those features. Right. Yeah. But you can't tell people that up front. They, they've got yeah. to have, they want to have the headroom. They, they'll be insulted yeah. that you don't think that their software could be that popular. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I love looking at the Excel spreadsheet and they start by saying, okay, I'm a, 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 I have a beer buddy startup and there are uh, 8 billion people in the world. Half of them are men. Half of them like beer. So I need to be able to sustain 2 billion people on my platform <laughs> and something like that. Right. And okay. So anything that doesn't work with greater than 2 billion of something is out of consideration. Right. And the issue with that is that think about trying to commute by train. I mean, you can move massive amount of goods in a train, mm. but the cost of a, a, a opening a new train truck is yeah. huge. Mm. Huge. And uh, if you just want, you know, to go to the grocery store, and in order to do that, you need to lay down new trucks and buy a new train. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, uh, insane. And we see a lot of that happening, uh, especially because the bigger you are, the, the harder it is to pivot and uh, evolve your software. So people who go with, uh, oh, I need to be big from the get-go, end up with a system where uh, they are very inflexible because it meant, you know, I need to handle new traffic rush hour with, you know, a million people an hour uh, going through me, stuff like that. And what we tried to do with Sharding in RevenDB was to say, okay, I have Sharding. It's working. It can scale you up to as a, 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 to the level that you need. But at the same time, I want to be a, a smooth progression. So you start with a thousand users and just single database, and then you go and you go and you grow, and at no point along the way do you have to deal with this cliff of unsustainable upgrade, which is typically what you have. And it turns out that doing that and doing that properly is, uh, how do I say that, somewhat complicated. <laughs> And it's somewhat complicated because we wanted to it's be able hard. to... freaking hard. Let me translate yeah. that for him. <laughs> freaking yeah, hard. Yeah, it's like the, 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 level, the number of uh, edge cases that you run into. Okay, what happened if... Uh, uh, what happened if as your system grow, you're now adding a new uh, a class to the system? At the same time, you keep on uh, uh, reading and writing to the data. And other backend operations still needs to work. And it turns out that sharding itself is relatively simple. But then you have uh, all of the moving pieces to make sure that it keeps on moving. That makes things a lot more interesting. And Orin, I'm going to interrupt for one moment for this very important message. And we're back. It's .NET Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. That's Carl Franklin. Hey, hey. I'm talking to our friend Oranini after entirely too long uh, and digging into the sort of meat and potatoes around the challenges of sharding. How do you maintain transactional integrity when you're talking about these kinds of velocities too? So let's talk about transactions in general. Mm -hmm. One of the things that revenue exists because of transactions. In going back to 2008, I looked at a relational database that said they don't do things properly. Hmm. And I went to look at NoSQL databases, and it was, yes, exactly like that, but maybe with less of juggling knives. 
and maybe we <laughs> less t- juggling knives. There's yes. a tagline for you, that's, Raven that's DB. Awesome. Less juggling knives. Less juggling knives. <laughs> so uh, the, the the problem was that I remember uh, uh, being told, "Oh, you you go and implement transactional behavior inside of your application code on top of a non-transactional storage." As someone who mm. have implemented a bunch of transaction systems, that's not the way to go. No, no. Yeah. And the chances that a dev- regular developer is just going to get that right in the first place. And even when they get it wrong, detectably wrong, mm. they, that's very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, just to give some context, the chance of a professional database developer getting it right is zero. <laughs> just to give, just to give some context, uh, in, in the same sense that there, uh, there are zero uh, uh, C projects with no memory leaks in them, right? <laughs> unless you've done, you know, the uh, uh, full suite of Valgrin and Asan and all bunch of other stuff like that to verify that. In the database world, you have Alice and you have. Uh, um, there is one for a distributed system, uh, by a fear that I cannot remember what his name was. It's not Jenkins, but it's something similar. Uh, but basically there are a lot of tools that try to detect how you're doing things improperly. So if a professional can't do it right with the whole set of tools that they have, a non-professional who just, you know, I just want to make that button work have zero way of doing that. So I created RevenDB and transaction was one of the things that we had from the get-go because mm-hmm. this is not something that you can play around with. And right. transaction on one node are still relatively easy. Okay, I have to write to the right ahead journal, flash it to the disk, and then I can confirm the transaction. Conceptually, very simple. Practically, it's very hard to do that Fast, but that's the uh, implementation did. When you start talking about doing that in a distributed environment, this is where it gets really, really interesting. And at that point, you realize there are two types of transaction that you actually care about. And the first transaction is when you want to update within a scope. What do I mean within a scope? Let's say that Richard wants to buy a new bottle of whiskey. So, He's already got uh, it. <laughs> He's got them all. Yeah, yeah, but uh, now you need a new one uh, or More. an old one. He wants an old, uh, old bottle of whiskey. I'm one. sorry. Yeah. Yes. So uh, in order to process the uh, the order, I have to update the. I have to create a new uh, 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 order document in the system. I have to update the uh, number of orders so he gets the. A frequent buyer or a membership or something. So I have to touch multiple distinct documents. And I would really like to do that in a transaction. The nice thing about this is that this is scoped. So I can say, okay, all of Richard's details should reside within the same scope, which means they reside within the same node, which means that now I'm back again at the level of Oh, this is now a local transaction. I know how to deal with that. Now, that leads to an interesting problem because now I have to surface this operation to the user so they can make decisions on that. And the way that we did it with RevitDB is that we allow you to define a context for an object, for a document that says, okay, here is the Richard's customer record. And here, all of the orders for Richards belong to Richards, so they would reside in the same physical location. It turns out that when you're starting talking about these systems, the concept of locality is really, really important. So this is something that we allow you to define, which leads you to a whole different problem. Let's say that a, a Richard is buying lots and lots of stuff to the point where he's 10%, only his orders are 10% of my system. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, which sounds, can be either a very small system yeah. or a very big uh, order. That could happen. But, yeah. So, uh, what happens then? 
What, well, in many systems, uh, you typically divide the data into buckets, partitions, shards, whatever you want to call it. But uh, in many cases, that creates a huge problem. If you're talking about something like DynamoDB, a partition size is a maximum of 10 gigabyte, which means that at some point I have an amazing customer. He's, the, you know, he's 10% of my volume. I really want to have him. And because of a physical hardware limitation or physical software limitation, I have to him, oh, sorry, you cannot buy anymore. Right. And that's insane. So you don't want to do that. So now you have to migrate your big data system into a completely different structure. And the number of horror stories of people who build big systems and distributed environments uh, on that particular topic is insane. With the way that we design things in RevenDB, we don't have a, any hard limit. And let's say that we have a user who is utterly ridiculous in the amount of volume of data that he has. The, or the, I would start having concerns when a single user in this model would be bigger than one terabyte or two terabyte of data. And at that point, I think that, uh, okay, I have to do something within the next five years or so. Because I would typically say, hey, this is a, don't go beyond five terabyte on a single node or something like that. Uh, but then you realize that, oh, wait, if I'm talking about this, it's very likely at this point that the overall data set is in the hundreds of terabytes. And, okay, so I have one big customer. I can operate on that on a surgical manner instead of having to shift the entire thing. Now, I mentioned a, a scope transactions where this is just one person, but the next stage is, okay, what happens if I want to have an update on two different entities that reside on different shards? Right. So a cross shard transaction. And we have support for that but in order to handle that, you have to do something called cluster-wide transaction. And a cluster-wide transaction uses a system called Raft for distributed consensus. And Raft is a distributed consensus algorithm that allows you to make decision in a cluster of nodes with handling failures and all sorts of stuff like that. It's super interesting for the database developer person. Mm -hmm. Utterly uninteresting. To anyone else. They just expect they, it to work. <laughs> yes. Right. And, uh, and, and the nice thing about it is that, okay, you have a cluster-wide transaction. Shards are part of the cluster. It just operates. And now you move on. Mm. Yeah, there is another uh, uh, network hop that needs to happen. But that's about it. How, I mean, what's the performance impact on that? Additional ping time between the, between the machines. Right. So whatever the latency is between those yeah. shards. And... Practically speaking, you're almost always going to put them in the same data center. Right. So this, uh, then it's milliseconds. Yeah. And you probably need to get lost in the noise of the differences. Yeah. But, uh, but it's really interesting because now we are moving from, okay, so I have transaction, I have customer transactions, I have the ability to move my data between locations. But I, and then I also have the ability to take an existing application and in the back end say, hey, this is now a shared database. And the application doesn't care. It keeps on working in the same manner as it used to. And all of the other uh, uh, background stuff, integration with Kafka or needing to push to all of this or something like that, are maintained. This is part of the no uh, migration cliff that you have to hit. And another important aspect that I think is uh, really interesting is the notion of homogeneous topology. What do I mean by that? Uh, in many distributed systems, just the process of deploying a cluster to production, okay, you have a database node and a query node and a, a router process and all bunch of other stuff like that all of which that you have to manage and operate independently. With Raven, there is one process that is running, and you deploy that in a cluster, 
And then you get to manage that from the cluster itself. Okay, I want the data to reside on this node. I want this node to be just for routing requests. I want this node to be about this or about that. And Oh, the whole process is not something that you set in stone, deploying of the appropriate service or something like that. Just, okay, I have 15 machines, 15 revenue uh, uh, services running on them. And now I have the ability to play around with them as I see fit. And much more importantly, the uh, migration process between one topology and the other is very easy. And that reduced the amount of operational overhead by a significant factor. So when you're deciding what your shards should be, I, you know, when you're playing around with it, as you say, uh, I'm thinking to myself, well, if I had the ability to split up a database, maybe I would want, you know, this table on this shard and that table on that shard rather than like, you know, customer records A through mm -hmm. F or whatever. Um, for different reasons, maybe? Is that for, so that I can, you know, if certain tables are more active than others, I can sort of tur turn up the performance and the resources on that one in a very microservice-y kind of way? So the, the classic example, which isn't really suitable for sharding, but it's a great example to explain, is a data sovereignty. What do you mean by that? Uh, I want to keep Richard's data on a Canadian server. Ah, uh, yeah. I want, and I want to keep your data on a, a stateside server. Mm -hmm. And for legal reasons, the same for legal reasons, maybe uh, um, Europe yeah. versus the states is a whole different nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you're in California, there is different set of rules. So there, right. there is there are a lot of reasons why you might want to do that. So lots of data sovereignty conversations there. If you're in California, yes. you want to charge them more money. No. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're in California, one of the uh, emergency procedures that you have is a standby lawyer. Um, right. A, a, a while ago, there was a social study or something like that where they sent a, a legal letters asking for information about GDPR and the California law from companies. And that was like, you know, I would like to uh, get some information about your policy regarding blah, 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 blah. Okay, and the, that was apparently some study by university, but they sent it to a lot of people and someone did the math, and that stunt cost in the order of fifty million dollars just in lawyer fees. Wow! Just to be able to, you know, uh, you forward that email to your lawyer, and okay, we're going to need a couple of days to study that. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So anyway, that are some of the rules, uh, and you want to be able to say, okay, uh, uh, Canadian data is going to reside in node A and B. And California data is going to reside on a, a C and D, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do that. You can define, uh, you have to tell RevenDB what's the uh, uh, role, or what's the rule that you're going to use to split the data. And once you do that, you basically have the ability to split your topology into nested ones. So all of the Canadian goes to this set of servers, all of the California go to this set of servers or something like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's also a lot more fun when you realize that sharding and replication are orthogonal to one another. What do you mean by that? Uh, you have a database that is composed of three shards. But those three shards, you don't want to run each one of them on a server. Because if you lose one server, you lose one third of your data. That's not a good place to be at. So you're typically running multiple replicas for each one of the shards. And now you have to synchronize the state between them. Well, I have to do that. You don't see that. It just happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and failover between them and migration of data if a node goes down for a lengthy period of time, all sorts of stuff like that. It is amazing that the, the amount of time that I spend on edge cases that to the point where uh, you're not supposed to know that something happened. Right. And uh, I, th I think that the uh, uh, best case scenario I've seen that, 
I was in a production uh, uh, support call with customer. And, oh, I would like you to see, uh, I would like to get this information, but this would pass the process for a couple of minutes. And this is a production system. And they went ahead and did that. And like, whoa, are, are you sure this is, yeah, I know. The, this, the, we have the metrics over here. It failed over. We know we do that all the time. And that level of confidence when you see that, it's a whole different a, a ball game. And it was like, okay, so three years of my life were worth it in that, thing, in, that, in that case. So how does someone back up one of these sharded databases? <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> uh, I now, can translate that, but I won't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here is the... No, no, seriously. Uh, because there is a, a, a really big problem here. And it relates to Einstein. And what's the problem here is that you have multiple distinct shards. Each one of them is effectively its own database. And what you need to do then is to be able to take a backup at a single point in time, which is unfortunately impossible between different servers. Mm -hmm. So consider the case where you have non-transaction, so uh, non-cluster away transactions. So you have two different users modifying the data at the same instant, and now you have a backup. And it is possible in this case that one of those backups would capture the state with the transaction of one user, and another backup on another shard would capture the backup before him. And that's why I said that you have to be aware of, or you have to be, do it carefully. And this is unfortunately not uh, something that is unique to us. If I'm looking at Cosmos DB, Cosmos DB have two backups procedures. Right. Every four hours, for a maximum of eight hours. If there is a problem, you have better catch it within those eight hours or it's gone. Mm-hmm. And the I'm I don't know how they implement that, but I could uh, I could make certain a, a, a prediction just based off how I would do something like that. And uh it is a really hard problem. The way that Trevin B handles that is that we issue the backup command to all of the nodes at the appropriate time. And each one of the shards choose one of the nodes in the cluster, one of the nodes that, uh, one of the replicas for these particular shards, and then it execute the backup procedure. On large systems, the backup alone can consume a huge amount of resources. Try to imagine how long it's going to, t- to backup a 2.6 terabyte of data. And just the process of reading, compressing, and writing them to a, a third-party location or off-site location is multi-hours or multi-day. I wouldn't use Dropbox. Uh, just saying. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderfully, uh, uh, it's wonderful, but not, uh, but not something you can't drag and drop a two Correct. terabyte uh, in a second. Really annoying, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and it's really annoying because now you have maybe, okay, I want to do a, I would really love to do once a hour backup. Cannot do that with those sizes. So you have to do a full backup every week, every month, and then do incremental backups. But then you have to realize that, okay, when we're restoring, the restore process means that we have to restore on multiple a a shard at the same time. Mm. Uh, We actually have uh, two options here. We allow you to restore to a different shard topology or to the same shard topology. If you're using the same shard topology, then we can stream everything from the source to the destination uh, uh, directly, and each one of the nodes would restore the data, Mm. its data directly. But again, those are the sort of things that uh, you say, okay, the reason I have backups is not for recovery, because for that I have high availability, I have the off-site cluster or something like that. And just to give some context, again, we're talking when we're talking about those sort of databases, we are talking about systems that are in the uh, few terabytes to tens of terabytes and uh, or more. 
and just the time to restore something like that, just the time to copy the data from the offsite location to the local machine is hours or days. And then you have to uh, uh, do the actual loading process and stuff like that. So you tend to use that as, okay, I, if I need to restore for legal reasons, if the world is, you know, I lost my entire region or multiple regions and now I have to restore off locations, probably I don't care that much if it takes another extra day because my uh, uh, business continuity plan is already shot because I lost multiple regions or something like that. Yeah. Well, it's a difference between not being able to service your customers and actually losing their data. Mm. Yeah. So if I can get the data back eventually, that's fine. The bigger thing here is how do I stay up? And I'm presuming these scenarios, I'm probably using the cloud for my infrastructure. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I used to work with customers that would run multiple data centers with synchronized data and so forth. I just mm-hmm. don't know how common it is anymore. It's been a few years since I've done this work. Uh, the, in, I want to say in 2021, there was a, a file in OVH, a yeah, cloud provider. Germany. Mm-hmm. Yes, and they were, I think at the time, the biggest European cloud provider. And the fire uh, uh, burned out an entire region. Wow. Right. Uh, 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 no, I use the right terminology. You have a region, you have a availability zone. So it burned an entire availability zone, but it turned out the availability zones were different buildings in the same compound, basically. Right. So the entire region went down. OVH 2 was basically destroyed. OVH 3 and 4 were down for weeks, at least days or weeks. And even when they got the fire under control, it took them two days to just start restarting off the servers. And that process is not trivial. Yeah. So at that point, what you have to do is, okay, uh, I was running on a uh, one availability zone, my data was back up to another availability zone in the same region. And oh, what do you do then? Uh, what you tend to see happening right now is one of two things. Either people assume, okay, it's the cloud, so it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, okay, go shout at uh, Bezos or Microsoft. Yeah, we have somebody else to blame, <laughs> which is important. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, it's, I mean, <laughs> Uh, cover your cover yourself in this case yeah. is an important this is aspect. why I use the cloud so I have someone else to blame <laughs> yeah. uh, because the uh, downside here is that if you want to have a good business continuity story in that environment it means that okay I have to run on multiple regions uh, and I have to pay for data transfer between them and I have to pay for double the amount of compute, which most of the time is going to see their idle. Right. And at crunch time, you're going to have to face some ridiculous dependency that you didn't think about that's going to kill you. Yeah. Uh, in 2020, I think there was a glitch in the network in GitHub. One router went haywire for 43 seconds. And uh, it doesn't sound like, you know, it happens literally every day. And what happened was that their uh, monitor system detected that and shifted the uh, master database from the data center in US East to the data center in US West. That's it. And it worked as planned except for two problems. Because of the network partition, because of the router, some of the servers did not get that notice, so they kept writing to the old master. Some of the server went to the new masters, and now we have, they were using, I believe, a SQL server, and now you have a divergence between those two systems that you have to resolve. They end up actually resolving those transactions manually by reading from the log and applying that on a you manual got a BFM basis. on your hands. A big FM yeah. mess. <laughs> yeah, uh, but what is worse is that now they fell over the system from US East to US West. 
אוקיי, that was by design, but think about it, rendering a single page requires multiple database queries. Those used to happen within the same data center. Now they have to go to the other coast. Added 30 milliseconds of latency. Right. Well, it could be even but, 100, but still. Yeah, but you have 50 queries per page, 200 queries per page to render that. Well, somebody's got to talk to you about your architecture, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to give you some context, that was... Uh, that's common. Yeah. That's the worst I've seen by the way is 17,000 queries per page. I mean, there's got to be, I believe, there's gotta be uh, ways yeah. to consolidate those things, right? I mean, so many yeah. ways, <laughs> so many ways. But the, the problem, the, the, the problem with doing that is that in order to even be able to go to get to this problem, you have to realize, okay, what am I actually doing? And instead of you mentioned microservices, so I have a lot of microservices. Each one of them is doing something small. I'm composing that at the UI level. And when I'm suddenly dropping down and analyzing the, here's the user request, here's the database queries, you're seeing insane latency. And the classic example, I want to get a list of items and the details about each one of those items happening as a, a, a separate request for each sure. one of those. And it's insanely easy, easy to go to those levels. Well, and again, uh, we could, man, we could talk for hours about this, but I would think about getting those details on demand rather than trying to load all the details for every single item in your list. And that list should be small anyway and, f- and filterable. I mean, there's, I, you know, whenever I see software like that, I would just want to slap somebody. It's like, what are <laughs> you thinking? The, yeah, but the the issue here is that there was there is no somebody. Mm. That's the problem. You know, talking about distinct components written by different teams that are integrated by yet different people, yeah. and the amount of effort that is required to do something about that at the company level is enormous. And unless you hit the big pain point. Then, okay, let's paper over that. Let's add caching. Let's add something and just get things working. Uh, GraphQL came from Facebook specifically to address this issue of, oh, I have my information, but the manner in which I'm querying that was designed for one set of scenarios. If I have even a slightly different one, the API no longer sells me. Now I have huge latency, lots of queries, those sort of things. Hey, Oren, we're uh, out of time here by a couple of minutes, but uh, I just wanted to give you a, a big round of applause and uh, much gratitude for all your work over the years and coming back to talk to us. And if you haven't checked out RavenDB, ladies and gentlemen, you don't know what you're missing. Go check it out. My customers love it. And uh, what can I say? Thanks, Oren. Thank you very much. All right. We'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a, a time boy. Life is hard.